Check, check, check. Yo, what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of Elude Stalwart. Today, it's going to be Elude Stalwart Reads. I was just going to show you all my, my daily habit I try to keep up with reading. This is called, uh, this book specifically, Never Finished, uh, Unshackled. Hold on, let me this is by David Goggins. It's called Never Finished, Unshackle Your Mind, and Win the War Within. Actually, I have it up here. Maybe I could show it here too. So that way y'all could at least see what I'm reading. I don't know why I don't just read it off of here. I, was, I stand normally when I'm reading. So I figured y'all would get the same experience from the audio if I was just standing. I'm going to redo the introduction and probably cut this out later. Or I'll just leave it in so you guys can see, like, sometimes I cut out the introduction. But uh, we'll put it up here. You'll at least be able to see, like, the title and the name of the book. And then I'm going to read it off from over there off the phone. So here we go. We'll put it on the side. And we're on evolution number three. Uh, yes. I think I'll put the title here so y'all can see the title. Oh, here's a little snippet from it. And I'll, I can make that bigger, All right? Can't I? No, I guess I can't. This is the one we're reading, evolution number three. That's the page we'll start on. All right. Uh, we're about 25% in. If you're going by pages, this is page 73. Evolution number three. Many dreams die while suffering. Think about it. We conjure our biggest dreams, our most audacious goals, when we feel safe and warm. Even if you're struggling financially, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, your grand plan to defy the odds probably came to you in a moment of comfort, when you had time to evaluate where you are and how you got there. There's no space for big picture thinking whenever you're in the heat of battle. When all is calm, even temporarily, damn near anything can feel possible. So that's whenever you dream it up and map it all out. Then you begin an unforeseen challenges, uh, and unforeseen challenges knock you the fuck back. Whenever you're engaging in an intense struggle, the result of which will have a major impact on your life going forward, you'll be challenged to your utmost. And these moments of truth with lar within a larger quest can demand so much from you that you're bound to feel overmatched at times. When that happens, many people panic because they come to believe that they're imposters and that their dream was actually a fantasy. In a blink, they go from driven and focused to becoming convinced that they had no business even trying. So they quit right then, right there. While teetering on the edge, they, f they fail to grasp that there is something they can actually do to jam that quitter spiral, carrying them right down the drain. They can make the one second decision to think instead of react. During my second hell week, whenever I was in class 231, I was driven, uh, I was a driven motherfucker. Bill Brown and I were the leaders of the bro boat crew too. And we had our own competition to see who's going to be the next baddest man in the whole class. But there was another guy in the mix who had captured my attention. Let's call him Mora. He was about our size, strong and fit, and whenever shit got hard on the beach and the grinder, he gravitated towards me. He was not in our, o in our boat crew yet, wanted to feed off my energy because Bill Brown and I were performing at such a high level. We made, we made hell look and feel like not only manageable, but it, like it was easy. On day two of Hell Week, Mora found me in the chow hall with his lost book, uh, with this lost look on his face and fear in his eyes. I was busy filling my wet and sandy pockets with packets of peanut butter because I needed the fuel to withstand the punishment I knew was coming. Even after consuming as many calories as I could, in two hours I'd be hungry again and I would eat damn near anything, uh, even peanut butter gritty with sand and laced up with pocket lint. Mora stared at me as if I were a creature from a different time, and I was. I'd become wholly uncivilized after two days of surf torture and boats runs without a wink of sleep. I was now a caveman. Mora, on the other hand, looked like a traumatized modern man. And that was a clue that something was off. Hey Goggins, he whispered. His eyes darted in the room around. I don't want to be here anymore. 
the pressure cooker of hell week had temporarily unhinged him from his dream and his rational mind and he looked as if he was searching for an emergency exit he was panic in human form i knew that because I, that's exactly how i felt whenever the first wave hit me in the very first hour at the same hell week the Pacific Ocean was as cold as ever when it when that massive six foot wall of water picked me up, flipped me three times and pounded me into the wet sand. It was as if the ocean itself was saying, get the fuck out of here, bitch. And I listened because my lungs were still burning from the bout of pneumonia that got me rolled into the class from 230 just two months earlier. And because the water was my kryptonite, there was 130 hours of hell week to come. I knew that a good chunk of them would be spent on the cold ocean. That cocktail of suck hijacked by brain to send out signals far more troubling than ambivalence. I was wondering if I had what it took or if I was prepared for the moment. Then the voice in my head was saying, I don't really want to be a Navy SEAL. For more than a year, my quest becoming a SEAL had been all consuming. I never wanted anything as badly or committed to so completely in the process. But when you're locked into a suffer fest, there are times when conditions will become intolerable. A self-sabotaging impulse rooted in shock and fear will feel like clarity. It was I was a half step from voluntarily pulling the plug on my dream that had the power to change the course of my entire life. I glanced over at Bill Brown, resigned uh, to the fact that he would soon stand alone as the baddest man in class 231. Then from the knee-deep swirling shadows, I scanned the horizon, where a destroyer was heading out to sea. The instructors had warned us that if we didn't make it through the training, we'd be assigned to a ship like that. We'd be stuck uh, chipping paint for the six months at a time. They made it sound like the most miserable deployment on Earth, but to me, in that instant, it sounded like heaven. Most SEAL instructors love quitters. When you tell them that you're too cold and you want out and that you're more than happy, they're more than happy to take you by the hand and lead you to the warmest shower of your life because in their minds, it proves that they're better than you. Once you step in that shower, you get so warm within a minute, you forget what being cold even felt like. And then you realize your warmth just cost you a piece of your soul, if not the whole damn thing, which can lead to a lifetime of regret. Time was of the essence. I could not crawl back into the beach and take 10 minutes to get my mind right. I was in the eye of a psychological storm, and all around me the water was still frothing and growling. Part of the problem was that the cold water had stolen breath from my lungs. I was gasping and panic breathing. In order to think clearly, I needed oxygen. To take a deep breath, I took a deep breath and then another. And in that time, my possible future played out in my head. I watched myself stagger back to the beach and laid my helmet down. Within days, I was flushed right out of the military and back into Indiana, where I struggled through a series of low-level, low-impact jobs, which were the only ones that I was qualified for. Minimum wage security guard, lifeguard at the local pool, an exterminator. That was true clarity. All my aspirations would be vaporized if I let the surf torture behind me, because if I left surf torture behind me because I was a reservist. And if that and if I snapped and quit, the Navy wouldn't even want me on one of their ships. I could not afford to lose my shit. SEAL training and that cold ocean were exactly where I belonged. So I needed to calm the fuck down and meet challenges head on. I took a breath as the next big wave swelled. I smashed the shit out of, it smashed the shit out of me too, but I managed to scramble towards a group and lock arms with my teammates. I was done showing weakness. It was I was finished with fear. I would stay in the water as long as the fuck it took. When we got called back to the sand 10 minutes later, the men in my boat and the crew were shivering and stiff. They were so cold that they didn't even want the edges of their sh soaked t-shirts to craze their skin. We needed to warm up fast and the only way of doing that during hell week is to go hard. I nodded to Bill and grabbed the front of the boat and shouted orders. As a unit, the boat crew too started putting the fuck out of the hell, started putting the fuck out of, out like hell week was our natural habitat. Oh, they started putting out like hell week was their nat natural habitat. Often it's, sh often it's the shock that launches the spin out. For me, it was the snap of the cold water that triggered my fight or flight response which comes with an adrenaline rush that spikes the heart rate and puts you in insecurities on blast, you and your insecurities on blast. Your body and mind react that way because they want to protect you by telling you to get the fuck out. Fight or flight is exactly what Mora was experiencing in the chow hall. His fear and panic owned him. When I was, a te when I was teetering on the brink, I was able to physically calm myself down with a few deep breaths. 
and that helped me see through the adrenaline rush. My heart rate was still elevated and panic continued to creep in, but I regained enough of my composure to make a conscious one second decision to stay in the fight. That took mental fortitude and the water hadn't, sun, hadn't suddenly warmed up. I was still cold and miserable and staring at 130 hours of hell, but I was able to see that life, the life that I desired was right on the other side of surf torture. I did not cave into the emotion and quit. When people do that, they aren't even making an actual decision to quit. It's the default reaction due to stress. I get that it's difficult to not give in to all that emotion, acute pain, and discomfort. All, uh, I get that it's uh, not difficult to give in to all that emotion, acute pain, and discomfort. All you really want at that point is for it to end. You envision your bed and your home and how sweet it feels to lie down with your wife or husband or partner. You know your mom will greet you with a forgiving hug and that your family will understand that because they love you no matter what. You know for a fact that they'll console and take care of you when you're hurting or bad or scraped shit, scared shitless. And all of, the, all of that feels way too good to pass up. But you must remember that in those images of home, they aren't actually rooted in love. They're a product of your fear, disguised as love. Moore and I shared the same big dream. We both had our worlds rocked. I recovered by dominating Hell Week in a fashion that nobody had seen before. Mora's mind had already unraveled by the time I saw him in Chow Hall. He wasn't thinking consciously at all. His emotions were in control of him instead of the other way around. I couldn't help him because by then he had already lost the battle. I don't know when he officially quit. In Hell Week you get wrapped up in your crew so engulfed in helping another that uh, the ones on your side that after several hours you might look up and find that half the class has already bailed out. All I know is that at some point he rang the bell and lived to regret it. Everything in life comes down to how he handles those cru or how we handle those crucial seconds. When psychological, physical, or emotional pressures redline, your adrenal glands go haywire and you're no longer in control. What separates a true savage from everybody else is the ability to re regain control of their mind in that split second, despite the fact that the everything is still fucked. That's what people miss. Our lives aren't built on hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. Hell week is 130 hours, but it's not the hours that kill you. And it's not the pain or exhaustion or even the cold. It's the 468,000 uh, seconds that you must win. Oh, it's the 4,608, uh, 68, 4,000. <laughs> it's almost the 500,000 seconds that you must win. <laughs> it only takes one of those motherfuckers when it all becomes too much and you just can't take it anymore to bring you down. So it just takes one of them seconds to take you down. I had to remain vigilant in my, and manage my words or my mind for every single one of those seconds to make it. Life like Hell Week is built on seconds that you must win repeatedly. I'm not saying you have to be hyper aware of every second of your life, but you have to, uh, you, uh, I was just checking to see if everything was still recording properly. And I was like, am I even framed properly? And I realize I'm getting distracted. I don't mean to leave y'all hanging. Let's get back to it. All right. I'm not saying you have to be hyper aware of every second in your life, but if you're pursuing something that demands all you got and it means the world to you, that's often what it takes. When you're trying to lose weight or quit drinking or using drugs, your moment of weakness can be counted in seconds, and you'll need to be ready to win those seconds. You could be the medical student who has dreamed of being a doctor their entire life, only failing uh, at the crucial class, failing a crucial class early on. Overwhelmed with panic, you might be tempted to march straight out of the admissions office and withdraw. Maybe you're an aspiring lawyer with a job at a prestigious firm on your back pocket that you yet you failed the bar exam, and in the heat of that moment, you abandoned your career before it began. All because you become convinced that you can't walk back into the office and after another humiliation or study and study for that bitch again and put yourself right back into the chopping block. While school and professional exams are held in controlled environments, an F can spike the heart rate and trigger self-doubt as quickly as a six-foot wall of cold water. Sometimes that grade looms so large, especially in a young mind, that it's easy to feel like all the eyes are on you and your failure and that you've fallen so far behind that you'll never catch up. Moments of doubt are unavoidable when we take, a strenuous, uh, when we take on any strenuous task. 
I use the second one, uh, the one second decision uh, uh, to regain my composure and win hundreds of small battles during ultra races to pull to, on the pull up bar and in stressful work situations. And the first step is to mentally take a knee. The best person in any combat scenario is the one who, who's composed enough to take a knee when the bullets are flying at them. They know they need to evaluate the situation and the landscape to find a way forward. And it's impossible to make a conscious decision if their team is running around like fire ants. Taking a knee in battle is not as easy as it sounds, but it's the only way to give yourself time to breathe through the panic and rein your spinning mind in so you're able to operate. The battle hasn't stopped. Gunfire is still lighting up the night and you don't have any time to waste. In that one second, you must take a breath and decide to bring, uh, and decide to bring the fight. When you're ready to get a grip in life and the danger of losing your shit and are in danger of losing your shit, just think it's time to take a knee. Get a couple breaths and flash to your future. If you fold, what will happen next? What's your plan B? This is something deep con this is not some deep contemplation. There's no time to order pizza and hash it out with your people. This must happen in seconds. It helps to prepare yourself with uh, productive self-talk before you drop into the suffer fest on your schedule. Remind yourself that nobody is great at every single aspect of a job, at least not right away. And no runner skates through a hard race unchallenged. No matter how, it, how bleak it looks or how it feels, you must stay rooted at your baseline. If you're in med school, then your baseline is to graduate and become a doctor. In Coronado, my baseline was becoming a Navy SEAL. My men buckled under the log during Hell Week, but log PT was easy for me. I had to remember that every time we ordered back into my own personal torture chamber, I remember that every time we, we ordered back into my own personal torture chamber, the specific the Pacific Ocean. It helps me to remind you your it helps to remind yourself of what you're good at and where you excel so that whenever you have to engage in something that's hard for you, it doesn't become overwhelming. Tell yourself, I'm good here. I'm great here. This sucks, but I'll be over it in 20 minutes. Maybe it's the 20 miles or the 20 days or 20 weeks, but it doesn't matter. Every experience on earth is finite. It will end someday and that makes it doable, but the outcome hinges on those crucial seconds you must win. There are consequences to this shit. Quitting your dream stays with you. I can color how you see yourself and the decisions you make going forward, or it can color you and how you see yourself and the decisions you make going forward. Several men have taken their own lives after quitting SEAL training. Others marry the first person who comes around because they're so desperate for validation. Of course, the reverse is also true. If you can withstand the suffering, take a knee and make some conscious one second decision in a critical juncture, you will learn that perseverance and strength is uh, by winning the moment. You will gain strength by winning the moment. You will know what it takes and how it feels to overcome all the doubt and it will stay with you and uh, that will stay with you too. It will become pow a powerful skill you can use again and again to find success, no matter what scenario you're in or what life uh, takes you. It's not always the wrong move to quit. Even in battle, sometimes we must retreat. You might not be for ready for whatever it is you've taken on. Perhaps your preparation wasn't as thorough as you thought. Maybe other priorities in life are, uh, need your attention. It happens, it happens, but make sure that it's a conscious decision you're making and not a reaction. Never quit when your pain and insecurity are at their peak. If you must retreat, quit whenever, uh, quit when it's easy, not whenever it's hard. Control your thought process and get through the most difficult test first. That way, if you do bow out, you'll know that it wasn't reaction based on panic. Instead, you made a conscious decision based on reason and had time to devise your plan B. Mora quit on impulse. Usually, usually whenever you do that, you don't get another chance. Many great opportunities in life come around once, but sometimes opportunity does knock twice. 15 months after that morning in the chow hall, we crossed paths in Coronado again. It was my graduation day, and he was on our Huya class. The incoming trainees wearing the white shirts and sig had signified day one, week one. If all the 200 and some newbies, he was the only man there who wasn't smiling. He alone knew too much. After the ceremony, he approached and extended his hands and congratulated me. 
Remember, I said, many dreams die while suffering, bro. He nodded once and faded into the crowd. A moment later, I heard he made it through Hell Week. Or a month later, I heard he made it through uh, Hell Week. Five months later after that, he graduated and actually became a Navy SEAL. I thought about Mora as I gazed into my pristine polished mirror 22 years later while considering Babbitt's invitation to Leadville. I'd been living large for uh, longer than I'd cared to admit. In this new life of mine, the water was never cold, and the one-second decision was in danger of being becoming a perishable skill. I didn't think I needed it anymore. I had ac accessed all the finer things. In my house, it was always 72 degrees, and that shit feels good, especially when you believe you've earned it. While I put myself through a 10-week training camp or a 100-mile in Colorado's thin air, a 100-mile run, in, or why do I do this? Why do I put myself through a 10-week training camp or a 100-mile run in Colorado's thin air? I knew damn well how horrible that shit feels and what it takes. But I also knew that this right here was the, one of the most important one-second decisions of my life. This wasn't a fight-or-flight moment. I wasn't overwhelmed by the fear of death. I wasn't on the brink of failure or humiliation. I was beating slow and steady. My heart rate was beating slow and steady. This was a mature version of the unconscious impulse to quit. The one you don't see coming until it greets you at the gate when you finally think you've arrived. See, I don't have any respect for people who live the Lux life 24-7. If I said no to Babbitt, I wouldn't be quitting on him. I'd be quitting on myself. I would be making a fear-based choice no longer to be the very person who I became so proud of. Uh, Babbitt, for those that don't know, is a side note here, is somebody who offered for him to run an Ironman uh, triathlon marathon race or something like that. It's like a really long race, and he's just like going through whatever the night show. Okay, I would be making a fear-based choice to no longer be the very person who I became so proud of. It was all well and good to have success and reach a certain level, but I really don't give a fuck who, what, what you did yesterday. Maybe you finished Ultraman or graduated from Harvard. I don't care. Respect is earned every day by waking up early, challenging yourself with new dreams, or digging up old nightmares and embracing the suck like you have nothing and have never done a damn thing in your life. There are 86,400 seconds in a day. Losing just one of those seconds can change the outcome of your day and potentially your life. Hashtag one second decision. Hashtag never finished. Chapter four, a savage is born. So we went through three evolutions and now we've begun the chapters. And this is chapter four. Next time, guys. Next time. Oh, do y'all want to do some takeaways? Takeaways? All right. So the one second decision, that was an important thing. Uh, achieving goals and actually like struggling to accomplish something and receiving that is dangerous, especially if you don't continue because it can make you more relaxed. You can sacrifice that one second decision in a crucial moment due to comfort and security and uh, not making fear based decisions, taking deep breaths, um, motivating your team like he had like a team aspect. That's what I love about Go Goggins and uh, also uh, Jocko Jocko. It sounded like I heard a little bit of Jocko in there too, which they have similar backgrounds, right? So that, that would make sense. But yeah, my dad was in the Navy. So respect guys, respect. All right. Till next time. We'll talk to y'all later. Peace. Peace.